up here on the wall we have the Ark of Senility and you'll find among many many people who have a certain type of diet in a very early age will have this area across the top of the iris in the brain area in the head area where the sclera is pulled down over the top of the iris <clears throat> and this is called the arc of senility these people are not getting the proper nutrients and oxygen into the part of the body where you find this particular cap and it's just like the sclera is pulled down right over the top of the eye you find this especially what my experience among people who have heavy spiced and salted food and I found these among the Koreans every Korean that I looked at I looked at thousands of them all the Koreans had this heavy diet of salt if you ever go into a Korean restaurant and you're not used to that heavy salt diet you'll never want to eat there again and these people all have a very heavy uh, Arca senilis pulled down over the top now so diet has a lot to do with it age has a lot to do with it and as the body starts to malfunction then we start having different problems which we call the arc of senility and we have a lack of concentration lack of memory lack of ability to put things together because things just don't come out right the way we want them to come out right verbally next one please Anita now as we have the arc of senility moving around the body we have it like this where the sclera literally is pulled down all over and we have a lack of blood supply and lack of uh, oxygen therefore not only in the brain area where you have the arc of senility but now this arc of senility is all the way around the iris and this is where it is called by Dr. Jensen anemia in the extremities and this anemia in the extremities means that the hands are usually ice cold the feet are ice cold you know the 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 outside part of the body the skin I would call it the cell level because where we have in zone number seven around here we have the uh, zone seven is the skin level in the Jensen chart I would call it the cellular level and here I would say that the entire body at the cellular level is being deprived its oxygen and blood supply. Anthony. I was just interested in, in the anatomy here. That is, uh, this you are actually seeing the edge of the iris being what is white. In other words, it's the iris is being pulled in. I would call it a grayness. It's uh, not a really a whiteness because it's when you pull it over and stretch this over the edge of the iris. Let's say you have a black spot here in the iris. You can't see it because the sclera is pulled up over it. But you can see it if you look down from this direction from the side. And so you have to have them maneuver the eye around so you can look under that particular capping of the sclera which is pulled over the iris. You know that uh, that's, that uh, slide or uh, illustration you had of the eye, and it showed the iris coming over the lens. So if we if we see the uh, the iris is coming like this, and then you've got the pupil in between. In other words, the sclera pulls in from the side. Yes, right? but like now that, that's a pterygium. Now let's say that this is a left iris, and the left iris, the nose would be over here would have a trigium coming in from the medial side covering the iris that's not what we're talking about that is a actual growth on the sclera of the eye called a trigium if it comes from the lateral side it's called a picawilliam we'll get to those well I have some we'll have them shown here shortly okay next slide by the way this anemia in the extremities I want to point out the, the no, n no circulation and no nerve supply to the, to the various parts of the body. And here's where you really have to work with a lot of niacin, a lot of oxygen, and uh, exercise to get that blood supply out there. And it will gradually go away as the health of the body returns. 
Now on this one, the carotid artery, we're talking about the right sclera. Now can you bring this over here, this is a bit, Anita? Okay, the right sclera, now remember the nose is over here to your far right. The, this is the side of the head over here. So you're asking the person simply to, now if I'm dealing with the right sclera, I lift up the eyelid like this and have them look down to the left. And then that exposes this portion of the sclera. Now oftentimes we will find in about one out of every 20 people that you look at, roughly, you'll find a line coming down right approximately at 1030. Now usually that's touching the iris. And here's where a person complains that they'd feel that they're not getting a lot of circulation up in their head. Now you'll find that from an anatomical point of view, a person has had a neck injury, possibly through an athletic event or a whiplash, and what you have is a little, it's like you have a constriction in the blood vessel, like a little uh, hourglass figure, and you, you've had that blood vessel injured on the side of the neck, and that uh, oftentimes that injury restricts the flow of blood, and you will find that this will be directly connected to some sort of a physical injury to the carotid artery, which takes the blood up to the head. Now, if you find this on one side of the body and not the other, then you'll find that certain facets of the brain, which are fed by this carotid artery, are blocked off, and yet other facets of the brain, no, no problem. The person is very clear in their thinking. Uh, so we have to look at the iris of the eye and find out why, for example, on the right side, which would affect the right side of the brain, you'll see a lot of the defects in the iris on the left side because from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock in the brain area, you see that on the opposite side. For example, the brain on the right side, where are we? This is the right eye. Okay, we want the left eye. Okay, so the right eye here from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock in this eye reflects what's going on in the left brain of the individual and that brain indicator in the left eye will tell you what's going on in the brain on this side. And so it becomes quite an interesting phenomena. So you always look at the carotid artery to find out if blood is being shut off to the brain area. Next, please. Yes, sir. I know very little about iridology, but in view of the position at 1030 of the neck there, right, the vertebral artery, of course, goes up through the transverse processes and, into, and then the carotid artery runs up just by the ear, so they yes. both could be relevant to that part of the chart. It definitely could. So it could, could it also be the vertebral artery? It could be. Yes. It could be. This has been appearing to me, though, from my findings, would be the carotid artery in that area. Now, for example, in the right iris, can we come back here? Well, let's take this one. Here's the carotid artery. Yeah, bring it down here, Anita, please. Down? There. So we have the carotid artery at 130 in the left iris, which would be the left side here. Okay? The, you'd find the back area here, correct? In the left iris, down through here and you find the neck area up in here which actually would be at the back of the head and so you find the carotid artery would be tied in very closely to that it's not toward the front it goes up through here but it's also integrally tied into that whole area I, uh, and this is where it appears to be okay and that does shut the blood off to the head area now, from an anatomical point of view, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to come to light, a lot of changes that will probably, probably be made. This is not set in concrete. This is what I find now from my experience. And we could be very well, you know, when people become more in tune to the iris of the eye as related to anatomy, 
we can have a large number of changes, Anthony, in the future. Okay, sir? David. How would that actual line appear in the case of someone who'd had a stroke or strokes? I will get into strokes in a little while. Okay? Next. Now I want to talk now about a tie-in. Okay, Anita, could you get the Jensen chart? Put the left. It's good. Now if you notice, right here, you've got the pituitary gland right roughly at 12 o'clock, and roughly just inside of 11 o'clock you have the pineal gland for the left eye. Okay, take the chart away. And so here, this would be an indicator roughly at 12 o'clock-ish. Coming down, the indicating line. This would be an indicating line coming in roughly at 11 o'clock-ish. And you have this particular line, which will be a tie-in, which will also be a degeneration line, which will indicate that you're tying in two sections of the iris of the eye in through an area which will probably be related to the stomach or the intestine area because it will be very close. If the tie-in would be up in here, it would be a tie-in through the endocrine gland area and so on and you have that tie-in can be from a structural position clear up toward the top of the iris. Now what I have found, now this is preliminary research over roughly about 15 years. What I have found is that whenever I have this particular tie-in, I somehow relate that to emotions. In the, from the sclera. And so I would have then on my body electronics flow sheet probably four little X's in the pineal area and I would have four more X's in the pituitary area. And then there was a lady from Indiana by the name of Loretta Flora who discovered in her experimentation with point holding and body electronics that if she would hold the pituitary reflex on the left side of the body with the pituitary reflex on the left side of the body primarily in the big toe that when the person went through a healing crisis on those two points where they burned and then when they went flat slowly, sometimes one goes flat before the other, if both continued to be held until they both went flat together, there would be a pulsing pulse, pulse at 72 beats per minute and then when they went flat, this tie-in here would disappear entirely from the eye. And this would then be pulled back away from the iris. This would be pulled back away from the iris into a more um, normal, if we want to use that word, a normal positioning. So the body electronics point for the pineal and pituitary, you hold it both together at the same time simultaneously until both complete and you'll feel that both points as you're holding them will pulse out simultaneously and there will be changes not only in the sclera of the eye but in the pineal and pituitary portion of the iris of the eye. Now hers was not relative to these two to begin with but hers was relative to the pineal pituitary thyroid tie-in where there were three points held simultaneously 
and then that tie-in of those three points all disappeared, both at the, uh, all three of them at the same time. Any questions? Peter? Uh, Peter? I don't know whether it's a true tie-in. But Sp speak real clear in the mic there, Peter. I don't know if it's a true tie-in, but we often have these organs joining together higher up. If it's joining higher up, yes. then it could be from structure to structure. Yeah, yeah always. Yep. That's still a tie-in. That's still a tie-in. Yeah. Yeah. If they join yeah. together yeah. by a de yeah. degeneration line, that or even a, a line which we'll call a, a transversal line, which Kyle yeah. spoke about earlier. That's quite common. Yes. Yeah. While I'm here, the other thing is I've seen an absolute, like a fishing rod straight line coming up from top to bottom. Through the iris? No. In the sclera. In the sclera. Absolutely dead straight. Yeah. I don't know what that is. That is a line that comes absolutely dead straight down from the top down to the yeah. iris. <laughs> I, I know that, but okay. I don't know what it represents. <laughs> now what you have to do is you probably hold a point that you think would, that would conform to, and then see what happens to the line. But it's here. And then not be too way. sure about that, because you know if you hold one point on the body, it can affect everything. But everything's all bent, and this one's just sitting there absolutely straight. Okay, that's interesting. Kyle. If it's close in, and you wanted to hold the two points together, and say it was in zone one and two, would you hold two points in the abdominal region in the bowel, or would you hold the two endocrine points on the feet? Okay, you'd have definite reflex points directly at a zero degree reflex from both the pineal and pituitary in the ascending colon. Uh -huh. I've never done that, sir. I don't have an answer for you. So. If the tie-in was close in or, or further up, you, you pretty much, if you hold the endocrine glands, you usually seem to get the result? Or? Yes. Now, why couldn't there possibly be a situation where down in the bowel area you have an indentation showing uh, scar tissue or a stricture in those areas of the, of the, the um, transverse colon? And we do know that this entire area reflexed you know, you work with one part of that reflex and the whole thing heals. Why couldn't you hold the bowel points uh, where the strictures are? And then why couldn't you see this change also? Because by reflex, you're directly affecting the pineal and the pituitary. Mm -hmm. and now, you might even have more pain on those two points than you would have either the pineal or the pituitary. Okay? Other thing is, how to differentiate this from a concussion line, and also... We'll get to that. How to differentiate the a fork in the pituitary from the hiatus hernia. I don't think you can. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, let's talk now. Please hold your question. Let's talk now about the endocrine system as related to the seven emotions. Where I began to look at the indicating lines, I would find them very definitely related to the various endocrine glands in the body. And then I started looking at the emotions that people went through it, during a healing crisis. And I would see if there was an indicator in the sclera of the eye leading to the pineal gland just by itself now, j now listen carefully if there's just an indicator in the iris of the eye going to the pineal gland I would find that that person would have a blocked enthusiasm where they just didn't have an enthusiasm for life it was very difficult about them to be really enthusiastic about everything or anything. Now I found that people that had a blocked 
pituitary function because there was an indicator coming straight down into the pituitary area in the sclera of the eye I would find that that person had a lot of trapped or suppressed pain that they could not remember now this can also be a genetic memory if the father or the grandfather or the grandmother etc uh, suppressed all of their pain through various trauma then the child is also going to be suppressing pain in that air, same area and thus they will have a suppressed activity of the pituitary gland because the pituitary is directly reflexed to pain as the pineal is reflexed to enthusiasm on that chart that we talked about uh, during last weekend when we went through the iridology portion of this okay now if you don't have that chart get one if you don't know what it is talk to Anita or myself or anybody else they all know what that chart was because some of you weren't here last weekend and that's where you have the the seven emotions the seven fiber levels the social structure uh, that the person is apt to uh, uh, abide by so to speak and we had the uh, we had the uh, the seven endocrine glands now that you should have under your belt and have that committed to memory because especially when you're looking at these um, indicating lines now if you have a tie-in now between the pineal and the pituitary this means that the person had a traumatic event happen to them either on a genetic level where they've inherited from their ancestors or in this life or prior experiences but they're right here now in this life here in the ever-present now is where they are so let's worry about the now and they have had a tremendous traumatic emotional experience they're still carrying around with them which would be suppressed enthusiasm along with suppressed pain and with that suppressed enthusiasm and the suppressed pain together you get the tie-in between the pineal and the pituitary is that clear anybody any question on that okay the next one please Anita now this one on this particular slide which eye do you have the right eye and which are the indicating lines there are how many so you have which ones pineal pituitary and thyroid so this is one of the most common ones you're going to find is the pineal pituitary thyroid tie-in and this is the one that uh, Loretta Flora used in her experimentation by holding the pineal pituitary and thyroid reflex points using the foot as the as the source of those reflex points and she would hold them all simultaneously until they all throbbed out simultaneously at which time the emotionality would be re-experienced on the mental level and the emotion would also be very extreme in cases because all of their life a person would be going back to a first major suppressed trauma and that would tie in to everything they did from that time on on a reactive level and so you'd find suppressed enthusiasm you'd find suppressed pain and you'd find suppressed anger all simultaneously now herein if you find this particular configuration in the left side of the body or in the left sclera the left side of the body is the yin side or the receptive side the right side of the body is the yang side or shall we say the aggressive creative side 
Now, if you find this on the left side of the body, we then associate that where we have a loss of enthusiasm, a loss of pain, suppressed pain, and suppressed emotionality as associated with receptivity or the ability to receive the experiences from life around you. Okay? If it's on the left side. And this is oftentimes related with female energy. Mother's energy. Because, see, if you resist your mother as you're growing up as a child for any cause, and most of us will not remember it, then we take upon ourselves the energy of our mother and become like our mother in every respect, all reactively. And so what we will have, if mother had certain tendencies and she manifested those certain tendencies as we grow, as we grew up, and then we would react against those tendencies by our resistance, we would take on those same reactive activities into our own consciousness, build it into the physiology of our body, and then end up acting, pardon me, reacting exactly like mother did to the same sensory stimuli. And sometimes you, somebody will come up and say, you know, you, you're just like your mother, and that's the last thing you wanted to hear. Okay? because you have the same characteristics that your mother had. Now this can happen to a male, it can happen to a female. But if you have this configuration in the left iris, in the female side, and only in the female side, you don't have it on the male side, what we have found, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, you're going to have reactive tendencies toward female energy. So a woman comes into your life, male or female here, and the woman comes in and she's acting perfectly normally. The hair comes up on the back of your neck and because this woman has infringed into your space. Now if you invite them into your space, that's one thing. But if an aggressive woman comes into your space, immediately the hair comes out, up on the back of your neck, you become angry, you feel pain, and you're very unenthusiastic about the appearance of this woman into your space. You follow me? And that's what you'll find. You'll find this person is highly reactive against any type of female energy. Now let's turn, turn the page a bit and take a look at the idea of three, these three particular uh, indicating lines being in the right sclera in the pineal pituitary thyroid area. When you're dealing with that pineal pituitary thyroid area in the right eye, your reactive mechanisms are going to be male or young oriented. And so even though it's only on the right side now, that's, uh, that's where it is, you'll get along with females perfectly fine. Whether you're a male or a female does not differ. If you don't have it in the left eye, females don't rattle your cage. But if an authoritative man walks into the scene, being very macho, being very male, being very young, the hair comes right up on the back of your neck, and, you, and you're ready for a fight. The anger comes out reactively, the pain comes out reactively, and you're very unenthusiastic about this situation. You feel like your 10 acres are not only being violated, they're being totally ruptured again. Yes, sir? Yep. Ian. Uh, John, the thought just came to me when you're talking about male and female, so that means that males that associate with males and females that associate with females, is this the reactive pattern from this symptom? Nope. You can have all the male friends in the world, no problem. And females uh, can associate with all the female friends, there's no problem. It's where there's the reactive aspect, that's what it shows up in here. Now. I hope you're ready for this. I've done my research on this for 40 years. 
If a man growing up resists a female mother, auntie, dominant sisters that are older and so on, if a man resists a female where there's all kinds of emotionality associated with that female, he takes on that female energy that he has resisted. And he'll take on the physical characteristics of the female. He'll have a lack of body hair, for example. He'll have the soft feminine figure that will be developed. He will have a very slow development of facial hair. He will talk like mother, if it's mother indeed. He will act like mother. And he will hate mother with every fiber in his being. And if he's not aware of it, it's suppressed below the level of consciousness. And during point holding, that anger and hatred will come out toward mother. Somewhere along the line. Now, if you take very carefully a galvanometer, a sensitive galvanometer, which we have done since the early 50s, and measure the male energy, the average male who is healthy emotionally, listen to my words, who is healthy emotionally and doesn't have these tie-ins of any kind, will normally be at about 12,500 ohms resistance through the human body. The average female who has no resistances toward males and so on will have 5,000 ohms resistance through the female body. Now this is held consistent over the years. Now a man who has this resistance toward the woman no longer has a 12,500 ohm resistance. He'll have a 5,000 ohm resistance by measurement through the body. He has taken on the energy of the female by resisting and hating his mother. Are you all there? Now, having worked with a large number of gays over the years, I have found myself less judgmental than I was years ago toward gays. Because I have found that when you work with a gay who has had, now not all gays have resentment toward their mother. There are a number of factors that enter in. Some people are born that way with the resistances already within their being and they actually, from the time that they are born, the male has taken on female characteristics genetically from the time of conception because at the time of conception for example I hope you're hearing me if a male in a rape situation has zero respect for a woman and is having a hatred for the woman that he is raping and conception takes place is that energy at the time of conception going to be embedded in the egg and the sperm? Yes, it is. And so a child is born that way. Therefore, it is a crime to have three strikes against a kid before he is born to not have that child conceived in love free from resistances of both the male and the female. You got that? There should never be a sexual relationship between a man and a woman resulting in a child if that child is not conceived in unconditional love. That's why many of your children born outside of the marriage relationship where there's a genuine love at that time of conception between the male and female seem to have far superior intellects, intelligence, intuition, and so on because they are a love child. And why some of the children, the longer the male and the female stay together, and the, old, the first children are of a certain way. Later on, if there's less love between the male and female, the mother and the father, or the husband and wife later on downstream, it seems like the children become more ill the old, as the children in the family, like the third and fourth child in the family, as they grow older. Until finally, when it becomes just a, 
uh, the woman gives in to the man just to get his uh, get it, get him to go off so that he can sleep at night you know or it's just like a, a one rabbit uh, jumping another rabbit you know you're gonna like this digit type of thing and the woman's left totally hung up has no interest in sex whatsoever and the you know you have that you see it all the time the woman doesn't want but he, she gives in to the man just to keep him satisfied, to keep him happy, so she can have some rest around the home. You have it all the time among families because the older they get, the longer they stay together, the less love they have for each other, the less respect they have for each other, the less sex there is in the family, or at least desire for sex. Now here's where the children are born in an out of love condition. And here's where they get these energies that I'm speaking of. And therefore these children become effeminate when they get older. The male becomes very much like a female. The women become very butch in many cases because of the energies they have. They're born that way. They're born lesbians and they're born gay because those energies were there before they were even conceived. Now, when you start looking into every single aspect of this, you will find, my golly sakes alive, the implications here when we start holding points on these people. Now, you take a lesbian, a female who's very gay, very, shall we say, very lesbian and very activist, and you get out of her system with point holding all the hatred and resentment she has toward men, which go back usually to a father figure, usually an incestual relationship and so on, as she hated every moment of it. And the idea of being with a man turns her off. That leaves only one alternative, women. And so she's with her women partners. And this becomes a satisfying sexual relationship. But you get her to forgive her father. You get her to remember all the details of what took place get her to release the resistance and suddenly she loves her father and suddenly she loses all these male characteristics suddenly her breasts begin to grow suddenly she has a feminine figure and suddenly she has her voice rather than being raspy and having hair on her face the hair disappears in her face she becomes very feminine and her voice is elevated and oh my goodness the change that comes over her and all of a sudden you have totally destroyed her entire social life because she no longer has a reactive drive for women now let's look at that if you hate the father and you take on 12,500 ohms resistance which you'll measure with a very sensitive galvanometer then by the law of attraction, the women are attracted to men. That's the way things have, uh, were established here as part of the game rules. The woman no longer at 12,500 ohms is going to be attracted to women at 5,000 ohms or whatever they are. She's not going to be attracted to a butch at 12,500 ohms. Do you follow me? She's going to be very, very attracted to the gentle female 5,000 ohm quality and very aggressively pursues them. But after she blows that out of there, she's no longer 12,500 ohms. She's 5,000 ohms. She comes back to her normal, basic DNA pattern. And all of a sudden, she has all of these urges that she's never had in her life, and she goes right through this teenage feelings and emotions and blushing and whatnot of having tremendous sexual drive for males. In Maui, Hawaii, we had a female activist in our advanced classes. And she was a very aggressive female lesbian. All of a sudden, she blew out all of her anger toward her father. She completely changed structure. She is no longer hardened like a man. She was soft like a woman. And all of a sudden, she fell in love with this other sweet guy, and she just fell head over her heels for him. And they were went on a weekend camping trip up in Haleakala Crater on the Isle of Maui, disappeared from society for a few days, 
and she came back pregnant. I got a letter from her and she is so happy. She has the most beautiful little child. And she says, I don't know what's happened. I don't know what you've done to me, but I don't want anything to do with my old associations. And I have this deep love for men. Of course, this other man was just a passing situation, even though he claims the child. But she's on and she's found very wonderful male permanent relationships later on downstream with this beautiful child. She's no longer an aggressive lesbian. Are you, are you hearing me? Okay, that's one of several things I could quote to you. We have many men who are gay and all of a sudden they're no longer having problems with being gay because they're pursuing females after they're, they're no longer have a tenor voice, they have a bass baritone voice, they have hair sprouting out all over their body, they change from a female figure to a very gross male figure, and then they become, you know, I mean, men think to themselves, how come women are so beautiful and men are so ugly? You know, men is like bull. You know, you ever see these ugly old bulls on top of the hill with all the heifers down there in the valley? And, the <laughs> and so the, the whole attitude changes. The male looks at things differently and sh he sees these beautiful women out there rather than somebody to avoid and get angry and upset at. Changes occur. And so the gay men do the same thing. They no longer have an attraction for males. They have an attraction for females. And you've ruined their social life. Now, here's what I would like you to consider. Don't be so quick as to taking a look at a female lesbian or a male gay. They're doing the best they can with the reactive mechanisms which they have. They're doing the best they can. All they are is reacting to their environment, just like we react to environment except they're reacting in their sexual manners. So we no longer judge these people. People do what people do according to their programming. When you change the programming, people go through tremendous changes. Now I would, when I talk about this, sometimes I have gays in the classroom and they start crying. And I have others get angry because as far as they are concerned they are perfectly normal and it's the straight people who are abnormal from their point of view because they are different. You, you see what I'm saying? Let's not be judgmental. Let's simply get rid of all of the resistances we have deeply embedded within us and suddenly we are changed beings. There are some people that swing both ways so they have more complex resistances within them. And this is uh, something that has to be worked out eventually and realize when this was worked out you have changed the entire social structure of that individual, his associations, her associations, and all of a sudden the person comes out of a melee of confusion which can last for a month or two and they come out totally changed in their thinking and direction. They have lost their reactive mechanisms. Now, I'm open to any type of questions you might have on the matter. Michael, come up here, please. Um. I feel really pumped up. Right Go the for it. Um, I was just excited um, or stirred by the whole conversation. Um, so to start with, um, you, you just said that some people can swing both ways. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Depending on where the, you look at their eyes. Mm -hmm. You look carefully with their eyes and in one mood, when one side of the body's in control, they swing one way. 
When the other side of the body is in control, they swing the other way. So if you have marked differences in the sclera of the eye, mm -hmm. they'll be totally one way, and then you look at the other eye, when that side of the body or brain is in the control, you know how the brain has a periodic shift from one side to the other? Mm -hmm. And you can see this very clearly, like, like the testicles of a man, one period of time the left testicle will be larger than the right, and then the right testicle will be larger than the left. And you have the same swinging with the brain and so on. The same thing with a female. If she'll ov ovulate on one side of the body, then she'll ovulate on the other side of the body through the ovaries. It'll be a change. Now, all of this can be looked at from the, from the sclera of the eye, and you can see this happening. So, that change in the sclera, um, so moving from... Left to right? Uh, yeah. So or right to left? From, Which would you uh, prefer to? <laughs> <the> female. <laughs> well, I've got both. <laughs> you do have uh, both. We yeah, all have both. I certainly have. Um, that, that's quite visible, um, you know, in, a, in an acute way um, in, in the sclera you know, yes. at, at, a, at any given time. Yes. To a, the trained observer. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, May I ask something here, please? Sure. How do we get this straightened out? By holding the body still on the table, by going back with a commitment and intent to remember our mothers and remember our fathers in various associations and forgive them for be to being totally human because they're programmed like we are, so that we, therefore we can find no fault in our mothers or fathers. They're just the way they are. And we let go of all the resistances while we're holding our body still encompassing the dualities and suddenly our bodies start vibrating like crazy and all of a sudden we look and realize we've lost that tie-in in the eye and we feel differently and we act differently and we're very strange because we're not the explosive or contradictory or swinging you know from one extreme to the other is gone continue on sir um, hmm. I'm just um getting a little bit confused. Um, it's just a Join the clan. I'm, I'm feeling at the moment. Um, so, I, I found um, working with people that I work with, I, I've done a lot of breath work and, and um, body work with people and, you know, I have a, a keen interest in, in this, um, in issues um, that we have uh, with our mothers and fathers respectively. I found that um, usually when you work with men, that um, it's easier, it's far easier for them to recognise the issues they have with their fathers. And many of them have dysfunctional relationships with women, but they're unable to see that and they keep on repeating those dysfunctional patterns. Um, they're far more able to recognise um, issues with their father and then vice and they'll resist with a great deal of energy the notion that they could be angry with their mother I, I, I've seen that with so many men and conversely I, I see the same thing with women you know they find it a lot easier generally to recognize anger and issues that they have with their ma mothers rather than with their fathers unless they've been uh, overtly uh, interfered with um, by their fathers. Um, so I, I'm wondering uh, in, in this type of work, I mean, in point holding from time to time, emotions are going to hit the fan, but I find a lot of time in, in point holding that generally we don't have a lot of emotional uh, release flying around. Oftentimes because we don't know how to look for it. We have to look for it like a hunter. We have to go out and get it. And we can't do it without the proper education. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Some, let me give you a subtlety, all right? Let's say a man has a very, very aggressive, very demonstrative, aggressively angry father. And this is where the attention is on how to deal with this aggressive father. The mother's not aggressive. She's very quiet, sits back in the corner while all this is going on. And what is happening is the man then 
resists the mother for not coming to the defense but doesn't know that he does this because he's trying to ward off an angry father you follow me yeah. and so what's happening is the man takes on the victim role of the female and the resistance to the mother is very powerful there but very subtle because mother didn't do anything and because she didn't do anything how can you criticize her because father was big and rough and tough and uh, boisterous and very angry and so you take on the victim role of the mother at the same time you take on the aggression role of the father and you become really two-sided at that point hmm. okay so um, if, if you feel that you swing both ways yes and you know like I clearly feel that and I, I mean I can clearly feel you know just having sat listened to this discourse you know my emotions shifting both ways and relating you know so powerfully to either ends of that argument that I, I've, I'm sort of I feel like I'm literally shaking now and I have been for the last 20 minutes <laughs> um, somebody get out a glass to look at his eye <laughs> <laughs> uh, it happens all the time yeah and I have a great deal of passion for the, for the subject um, what um, so pineal and like I could quite likely have uh, but not necessarily at all have a, a pineal pituitary thyroid tie-in um, the pineal um, and pituitary, po pituitary points would be uh, powerful points uh, for me to work with if I wanted to address this issue some more yes look where the indicating lines are and sometimes there's no tie-in at all they're just a clear-cut one emotion that was terribly suppressed at that moment of emotional trauma but if there are two or three emotions that were suppressed simultaneously you'll have the tie-in okay right. and then check whether it's on the left or the right side mm -hmm. and then look for rather than looking for personalities involved look for energies involved like yin means our receptive side yes. the right side would be our aggressive side our young side mm. and take a look and see where we feel we have failed or where we've overdone it or where our resistances are in both yin yang areas you know yeah. and then we just sit there and look and realize well is there anything that we've ever done in life that hasn't been reactive we take our advanced students who have gone through the visualization and consciousness class and usually after about four months every person will agree that they have looked at their issues in life and have developed their memories on these things and they shake their head and just sit back and spin for a while because they think is there anything that they have ever done that hasn't been programmed oh, I agree <laughs> okay I, I can't really think of anything else to say about it right thank there. you very much Michael yes sir Anthony come up here please um, it seems that as I review the process for myself, I was born to investigate my reactive... Uh, I was born with a body-mind to investigate reactive patterns. And um, when I look what a reactive pattern is, is when I reach out to find identity, or reach in to find identity, to a previous conditioned self. But when I reach out to find identity, say to this... this cup. It's a relationship to that cup. I, my I can first of all when I go towards it now it's of course an innate it's a passive structure but it was a moving structure I go towards it and I either go to blend with it to find identity that form of reaction the other form of reaction I destroy it I go it to destroy it to find reaction the other thing is I am I'm ambivalent I run towards it and, lo and love it then I hate it then I r run to it in the destructive and, and uh, part and love it and try to recreate it and um, and so forth. So I, in regard to that object, there becomes about four different reactive patterns. The other is I step back and I go neutral and I deny and I go numb. And uh, so therefore, it's not to get caught up with sexuality. We have this relationship with everything. Every some people have it with work. Other people have it with belief systems. We have it with everything everything comes down to the basic a uh, process in which there are two halves of us and one reacts one way and the other one 
feel it because we come even the egoic part comes from wholeness so it's trying to balance the opposite it runs to that part gives it some time and it, that's got to run back to the other part and give it some time and when it runs and interacts with each part it either does it in a way of being the child the, the follower or the leader and so therefore when it's the leader it, we call that the parent and when it's the follower we can call it the child and so Eric Byrne I mean I'm bringing in psychology here but in trans you know he said you know the basic mental states that we have critical parent nurturing parent rebellious child and accommodating child so it's just sexuality it's just we all are in this dilemma of reaction and the main thing with awareness is to see it at the thought level but also at the sensation level at the sensation level it comes up with a certain sensation in our bodies thank you very much Anthony now let's take what Anthony has just said which is basically as far as I'm concerned right on tie it into the gradient structure of growth that we go through we go from the gonad level sex reproduction we go from there to the spleen level which is your apathetic area we move up into the grief area of the pancreas and the adrenals and so on and we go continue moving up to the thymus level of the immune system and so on and we, each one of these will have a social structure that we've indicated as we move up which has a wide range of application now what's very exciting about this is that we cannot bypass any one of these areas uh, that we move up through the level where most people are stuck at which we have to go through and learn to understand these energies is relationships between male and female which encompass a broad range of what we call sexuality and this is one of the first things that we should put our attention on because the body really doesn't heal until we address these ba basic issues which have to do with the reactions toward the gonad level the ovaries the testes the reproductive organs because oftentimes we have so many different belief systems which say you shouldn't talk about these things now as soon as we have something where we shouldn't talk about these things then we limit our ability to explore these energy fields which have captivated us for years possibly for centuries and so herein along with the point holding along with the nutritional nutritional programs we need to have a support group of, of people of integrity not people who are going to use us for sexual abuse but people who have integrity in how they deal with one another so that we can discuss these things openly frankly and learn about them through interchange through discourse without having to do anything about that you follow what I'm saying it's a matter of learning to experience on the mental level that which exists on the physical level until we are free of those things on the physical level and this takes mental experience now there's a lot of vicarious experience that people go through but how much how long is people going to keep doing things on a physical level without dealing with them on the mental level it's a mental level where we have to apply the pressure go back to book one in the logic and sequence series and read it carefully until man can experience on the mental level that which exists on the physical level he will definitely be bound to the physical is that Reggie that just walked in Reggie good to see you sir welcome is your family with you good to have you here sir now here is wherein we have one of the most important things that is going to be a challenge to us who do we find to talk to on these matters or do we talk to anybody on these matters and simply take the principles apply them to ourselves 
and re-experience these things on the mental level. There are times when we're, we're, we are really little children. And in these areas that are new to us, we need to hold somebody's hand. And in turn, we need to hold other people's hand as a support group. Until in these areas we're strong enough to walk alone, hold our head high, where we have forgiven ourselves and forgiven other people for the myriad of manners in which we have disgraced others and disgraced ourselves by our reactive mechanisms that we have thrust upon the world in our aggressive outward procedures and or our inward withdrawing into ourselves and denying our own relationships with people which affect the other people around us. Say, how come I can't talk to you? How come I can't approach you? How come we can't share? Here's where we have to be non-resistant in all things and be grateful for every single experience that we have. This is difficult to attain to. And sometimes the only way this can be done is not being aggressive and not being withholding, but being still and know that we are God through a process of meditation until we can see everything clearly from a mental level, you know, rather than having to do something about it or having to not do anything about it. You know, the have to, I have to do nothing or I have to do something, both those can be equally reactive. There's a third alternative, and the third alternative is to be still and encompass the dualities as they arise on the scene, on the mental level. And this is where you are not focusing to the exclusion of all things, you are focusing to the encompassment of all things with a full awareness as to what's going on. You choose to receive and you choose to be part of the mental recreation of that event that you have received until it's no longer a problem to you and you can laugh and chuckle at our human antics as how we have dealt with reality in the past. Yes, sir. I also agree, John, that it's important to be still at the sensory level as, as well as, as you said, at the mental level. It has to be still because you cannot access the emotional body until you're absolutely physically still, breathing deep and regular in a meditative state. And then, by experiencing the emotions, you have to be still, neither suppressing them and denying them and neither venting them but remaining in a state of stillness or balance to where you can experience both sides of the emotions until they are no longer there because you have poofed the energies by receiving and recreating mentally. Now, then you have access to the mental body and you can then clearly see the thought patterns that have literally decided the course of our own destiny. Yeah, the difficulty with language is that by saying still, uh, the people think of repression. People can start to repress things by being still. I mustn't have that thought, I mustn't have this, or I mustn't have that sensation, or whatever it is. So the difficulty is, is a stillness, is what uh, maybe that I might be implying, is a state of openness and relaxation. And in that, attention arises. And so therefore it's constantly maintaining that state of openness. And until the tension is no longer until there. It's cancelled itself You out. poofed it. The polarities, and then I understand the play of polarity. The play of opposites. Play of opposites. The encompassment of duality and out. Uh, one cannot be discerning until one is capable of encompassing both ends of a given duality. Discernment comes only from the mental body. It does not come when you're a slave to the emotional body where you're encompassed with reaction. You know, you see these little signs around here and there. Be sure to be true to your heart and do what you feel like doing. That's one of the greatest mistakes in the world for most people because then they live by their reactions and they have no discernment at that point and they do some of the most foolish things in the world. Yet it is a true statement when looked upon from the mental body level because when you're free of the emotional body and you're strictly on the mental body level, then you're guided by spirit. 
and you can have full discernment as to what you're doing and you're no longer guided by your reactions but in this mortal mess that we're in which we're all part of if we go according to what we feel like doing we're probably going down the dead end path into identification with matter because we're letting our feelings and emotions dictate our policies yes sir and that's where sometimes there's a difference between the right hand path and the left hand path the right hand path is where you follow a certain morality of not allowing different thoughts and sensations to uh, thoughts to come up sorry and then you transmute in that process the left hand path is often called a crazy horse a crazy horse path in which you go into every emotion but the thing is that you act on that but you stay hopefully you're in that being able to come back and surrender and to allow the relaxation process and so that the alchemical or hermetic process occurs while you're in the middle of the emotion no matter how crazy it is for, for the conventional right hand path the unconventional left hand path might be, seem crazy be, uh, both have their advantages and sometimes are useful at different stages of life one thing I have found is if we allow ourselves to be guided by our emotions the fulfillment of that desire of our emotions becomes addictive and we are trapped then in that addictive state and it's very very difficult to overcome Michael first I think um, part of what I was um, saying before, or trying to say before, it, uh, it was incomplete, is that uh, because of the confusion and the lack of clarity and the inability that a lot of people have to actually own um, some of these energies that are, that are working inside of themselves and making them react, at times when we're holding points, um, some, uh, someone on a table might sort of start to go through all sorts of stuff and various people that may be holding their points are going to have all sorts of different types of reactions and, and feelings about what's actually taking place. <laughs> exactly. This could be very controversial within a given point, hold, point holding group and you know part of what I'm saying therefore is that you know, I mean, the group would all have to sit down and work through, uh, you know, the issue or, or the feelings that came up as a result of this and then try and sort of let go of any emotional attachment that they may have to certain, um, or to feelings that they have about certain things that come up and try and work through the whole thing in, in uh, um, a, a mental way. Yeah. now here is wherein we're at an enigma when we have a group of people hmm. because sometimes it's going to be a detriment to the people around you to really express what is going on within you because they'll never understand what's going on within you they will not be capable of understanding because they haven't had the experiences and so you tell a little tidbit to them and they it just blows their mind and they go home and tell everybody just trying to survive because their their crystals have been crunched so badly so it's best to never reveal those things on the table which are relative to your own destiny and the greater the secrets you can keep then more secrets will be given to you and herein is where you teach people a principle not suppressing it not venting it but remaining still and experiencing everything on the mental level according to the what I have written down in book one of the logic and sequence series and when you can learn to receive and recreate mentally you solve the problem I'm gonna promise you this if you tell everybody your problems you have created more problems than you've ever had before because first of all nobody understands what you're going through and secondly nobody cares what you're going through when you've been so so open with them and thirdly, <laughs> if we can have a third side of it, uh, we destroy ourselves in the process because many people no longer want anything more to do with us because of the erratic nature of the emotions 
which are so foreign to other people because their erratic ways of dealing with things to them is real. But your erratic little things, I mean, they're the most terrible thing that could happen. How, how do I think more to do with this person? They punch my buttons and I, I can't stand to be around that person anymore because of their reactions which are so opposite from mine. You follow me? This is the thing you're going to run into. So keep your own secrets. You still need to have a support group to help you out on principle, but not on things pertaining to personalities which does not, it doesn't involve them. You see what I'm saying? You teach people correct principles and let them govern themselves. Let them work it out. But work with principles, not with the personalities involved. Michael. Yeah, I, I see it as, as critical to, you know, um, the ongoing uh, viability of, of our point-holding groups, that um, people, well, I mean, we've all got to sort of be there for the long haul, but at times things will come up, and uh, some people haven't read Logic in Sequence, some people may not even understand half of what it's about. Other people, <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. That's me. pretty good thing to understand <laughs> half. <laughs> so, um, you know, but at the same time, I mean, if something comes up and and you feel, you know, from your experience that you know you have a valid point to make about it, and that you feel clear about the energies that have come up. I mean, it's also going to be very important to be able to sort of sit and talk with the other people in the group about what you see as the differences. And I suppose the only thing you can really hark back to is something like logic in sequence or wait till next time uh, we could get together with you. Um, but at the same time, I, I think, you know, what I feel to say is that, um, you know, if that ever happens with anybody that I'm working with, that... Um, I have a deep love for anybody who's involved in this work and that the fact that I may disagree with them has got nothing to do with um, you know, um, my feeling about them. I, I see that what they're doing is very important and, and critical to the process, but at times we're just going to disagree. And so here, when do you hold the body still and when do you intensify it by releasing verbally what you have to release to get a handle on it so you can experience it on the mental level. And so this becomes quite a problem and I don't have, know how to solve them all. Because sometimes if they've been babbling on and they, they can voice it all they want, then you have them hold the body perfectly still and experience it mentally. But there are some people, you tell them to do it and then they clam up so bad, they deny that they even have feelings and they don't even get to the touch of those things. Then you have to have them intensify the thing until you can get it out so they can get a handle on it mentally so they can be still then and transmute it. You have to be very keen on this and I don't have the answers for it because every person including myself will all be individuals on this matter. And it's a difficult deal to deal with. So get around you people that have a certain degree of trust with you and you with them and work with those folks and then help each other out along the way. It's going to take tremendous compassion tremendous forgiveness and tremendous understanding to realize that everyone has gone through things that are just devastating at times. And you just have to allow them that privilege and say, my, what a delightful deviation from the norm. And just hold that in your mind and then, then it's okay. Yes. Um, what you were just saying then has sort of answered my question. I was going to ask again about um, the importance of keeping quiet while one is on the point holding table because often I've seen you really encourage people to, to keep repeating a word pattern because sometimes you can think you've processed every emotion and you're just lying there having a good laugh because you think it's done but quite often there's still something left in there which you just haven't seen because I find that it takes tremendous mental stamina to really stay there um, because it's totally up to you basically because if you're not there and you just don't keep sifting and sifting and sifting, often you could be there for another hour um, in reality where really you've cut yourself, you know, you just think, well, that's enough for today. Like, 
do you know what I'm saying? How, when is it appropriate for someone to really blast out how they're feeling? Because at this stage I have to do that, otherwise you feel like you're going to explode. I, you know, I'm not able to... I thought I was processing it on the mental level, but I wasn't. I was just, you know. I remember this one little lady with arthritis. She wouldn't say, stay right here. She wouldn't say a word. I love everybody. I don't have a hateful bone in my body. How can you tell me I have suppressed anger when I love everybody? We finally got one little area where she was really had a memory of when she was angry. But I'm really not angry because I understand that they are human. And we're all prone to err, you know, and go through all this intellectual garbage. When the reality was she hated this person. And when it finally came out how much hatred she had for this person, and the more that she thought of it, ooh, do I hate that person? And when all the hate came out, the arthritis totally disappeared in the whole body when she actually could admit and no longer deny that she wasn't all sweetness and light. You know, we all want to think of ourselves as instant saints, and but we're not. We all have those little bits that we haven't dealt with, and because we think of ourselves as instant, state, instant saints, then we don't want to admit how much hatred we have for a person, or how we really want to go out and kill the buzzard, you know? Um, <laughs> these are the things that give us the arthritis. We let that all go, and then we can experience it on the mental level, and then we can sit and chuckle and forgive them and forgive us for being de de absolutely divine deviations from the norm. I hope that helps. Yeah, so if, is it really if by after you've worked up through the scale of emotionality and then you've hit enthusiasm, that's when you're sort of dealing with it more on the mental level and you're able to encompass the duality, right? Right on. Okay. Good. Okay, David. Just going back to the Solera lines, I wasn't quite sure you said because of the interchange of the brain from left to right, that the Solera lines, say on the right hand side of the eye, will show in the left hand side of the brain. That is correct. So we look in no, the right. No, no. Which side do we hold the? There's a crossover for the entire area, sclera and iris. Oh, so we actually work. What's happening over here in the sclera, in the brain area, is actually happening in the actual physical brain on the other side of the body. So you'll read the cilera and the brain on the same side? On what you see on this side, for the most part, will be happening over here. So you hold the points on the opposite side to the one you see? That would be correct. Thank you. Okay. Anita, where are we? Put that back on, please. Let's see if we... Okay, there's a typical tie-in. I want to make this very clear. We've discussed this before, but I want you to be aware that the tie-ins can be clear up in there, too. It can be way up there, or it can be down here, or it can be halfway in between, or it can be mixed, because the tie-ins themselves will vary. Next slide, please, or next uh, overlay. What time is it, Steve? Time, okay. One more. Okay, let's take this one now where we have the pineal pituitary thyroid thymus. Now this is the left, left eye. The nose is over that direction, okay? This is the left sclera. Now here's where we have the enthusiasm that's been suppressed, which is tied into the pain that's been suppressed which will be tied into the anger that's been suppressed, which is now tied into the fear that has been suppressed. Now, it's been very, very interesting to me to watch these relative to cranial work. And we'll have a tie-in with all of these indicating lines where when you're working on the triple axis in the cranial, if you remember, the first, the tip of your finger, for those of you who have been through cranial work, many of you have now, 
you the tip of your uh, the let's t let's take it in sequence the masseter muscle will be directly reflexed to the pineal gland and so when you're pressing up in the cranial on the right under the zygomatic arch on the masseter muscle origin then you're dealing directly with the pineal gland the tip of your finger on the pterygoideus muscles both the lateralis and medialis muscles on the lateral pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone when you're working with that one where you have that great big ball of resistance there okay if you remember that one that's directly reflects to pain through the pituitary gland and then of course the thyroid which comes down through this particular muscle structure right here the temporalis muscle it comes under the zygomatic process and it it's attached if you remember to the medial portion of the coronoid process of the mandible okay right there your fingers touching that part on the outside part of your finger when you're dealing with the with the left triple axis point you're dealing with the thyroid reflex to that point and then of course when you take your finger and putting it on the buccinator muscle uh, which has to do with the thymus reflex you're dealing then with your when you're doing your triple axis on your cranial work you're dealing with all four basic simultaneously and when the person goes through that burning searing pain through their body and they're able to get in touch with it which may take two maybe three cranials when that happens then this particular tie-in disappears and you have a person sitting there on his rear end for six six months sometimes wondering who am I what am I doing here how did I get here what have I been doing all these years and they sit there and you, and then finally they take start taking meaningful action again but then it's done by choice rather than out of reaction Sydney would you like to comment on that please or do you want you've been there you know what I mean how many months was it took you to settle out from your cranial about three or four months and that's the way it is uh, it takes some people a couple of years to settle out from a cranial because they begin to realize well what am I doing in life that is not reactive and they sit and wonder well everything has been compulsion well I have to do this and I have to do that that's what my mother and daddy did and I've, I'm, I'm programmed and then you have to finally reestablish and set your own programming and that takes a bit of heavy duty time and so this this particular aspect the, the pineal pituitary thyroid thymus tie-in becomes a very very important one for the immune system because if you have a large blotch as we talked about in the sclera on the medial side as we went through that part in the you know three o'clock nine o'clock medially in the sclera of the eye and the, we can't get that thymus to function properly sometimes it's because we have a tie-in with the thymus right here and then we have to find some way to hold the points which will be indicated by these particular lines and hold them all together until they throb out completely which you will find will happen with the cranial work and sometimes point holding will not be enough and you don't get these things out of the sclera of the eye until after cr the third cranial so this is not just a one shot you're, you're, you know you're you're free to go back to the golf course again type of thing this is this takes a lot of time because we're undoing not only all of our own stuff but we're undoing everything that we've inherited from our ancestors and that takes a bit of time okay any questions on this aspect of it yes Kyle 